All right, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom, Mishpacha. Okay, bye. <laughs> All right. What is the biblical new moon? That is the title of this message today. And uh, Brother Paul and I are on here. We're both really excited to bring this to you guys. This uh, this message, this presentation, um, it's something that uh, all of us, our whole leadership team, have been studying and praying about and, and reading up on for oh, probably say, a good year. Yeah, the better part of a year now. And, and, and he and Michelle, I mean, it's something that they've looked into as well, even before, even before then, um, and uh, Brother Robert as well. And so all of our leadership team has been... Um, and James, yeah. Yep, uh, just been, like I said, really seeking out this topic because we know that there's a lot of different ideas. There's there's two, mainly two different schools of thought on what a biblical new moon is. There's more starting to come out of the woodworks as time goes on. Yeah, there's always somebody trying to reinvent the wheel. So. <laughs> yeah, but, but mainly there's two big ones, and we'll talk about them in this message. And, and the key thing of this being, though, is is – SY7 Ministries is going to present to you guys where we stand on it, what what we see a biblical moon being in Scripture. We're going to give you guys um, scriptures. We're going to give you guys historical support. We're going to share this information with you guys to just, again, present to you where we're coming from, where we sit with the topic, and then you guys can study to show yourselves approve on where you want to uh fall in line with what understanding you have but uh yeah so so well to start that out with what he just said we're going to start out with second timothy chapter two so but shabbat shalom everyone david and michelle chucky uh t lynn and then of course our wives are both on there shabbat um, shalom, everyone. jeff krasinski carrie garcia and all of our people here helen powell <clears throat> linda doss Laura, and the Dale. list continues on. Yeah, Shabbat so, Shalom, everybody. Robert Brook. So Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Glad to and, have you guys um, on. Yeah, so um, now if, if okay, so first of all, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to Elohim, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. Um, I kind of, even though New King James is my go-to translation for the English more than anything, I do have I do have to say that in the King James, I like how it's translated. Uh, it says to be to uh, uh, to what did I say? Study. Yeah, it says to study to show yourself approved unto you. And I think. To me, I have to say, I think that is a lot more accurate because we're supposed to be Bereans. We're mm -hmm. supposed to be rightly dividing the word. We're supposed to not just take whatever anybody says and run with it, but we are to study it out for ourselves. Take the topic, take the subject, and go and study it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, anybody who has followed this ministry long enough knows that at one time I believed in the sliver moon, and then... Um, uh, about four years ago, um, due to some things I was looking at, I thought, well, maybe the conjunction moon was more correct. And um, and so kind of went that route. Um, and then we, but we always hit, one thing about this ministry that we've tried to always be is um, whatever we teach, we want to be able to back it all up with scripture, historical evidence, everything. And secondly, is that um, um, if we are ever wrong on something, that we have the um, the humbleness to come and say, "Hey, you know what? We think we had this wrong, and here's here's our findings," and um, or you know, or to reconfirm mm -hmm. what our findings have been all along, and and to show even more evidence or more proof of. Of, of a topic to to solidify our stance in something right and like Anthony said we've been we've been getting into this off and on for a year we've been studying it out and and we've had different people come to us on their thoughts in conjunction and and people come to us on their thoughts on the sliver moon and so 
it really became impressed on Anthony's heart, especially when we were in Israel. When, yeah, when we were in Israel to really uh, put this thing to bed once and for all, um, biblically and historically. And so Anthony himself did the, where, where the due diligence is, uh, it's it's on him. So if you do not like this message, <laughs> his phone number is. No, I'm just kidding. That's funny. But no, um, our our running joke here is I'm I'm here to say that SY7 Ministry we approve this message. <laughs> so uh, yeah. But Anthony really did his homework on this, and um, um, the only reason why I'm here <laughs> is because he felt like as being the, the head pastor of the ministry here that we should do this together. So I reluctantly agreed. No, I'm just kidding. This, this is really good. And, and I, I love what Anthony's done with this and he's really proven himself out. Uh, he's really proven Yah's word out in this and with the historical information and everything. And I think that for anybody who might be wondering or questioning at all, right. What what is the true like like it's titled? What is the biblical new moon? Yeah. I think after this presentation, this message, I think um, unless you just decide to reject what the word says and what historical documentation proves, mm -hmm. um, you're you're not going to have any more questions. And uh, I praise Yah for what Yah has laid on Anthony's heart and. And and the way that Anthony dug into this and really really searched it out, really sought the truth out. So uh, with that, well, we're all we're all uh, seekers of truth, are we not? I mean, that's yeah, that's what Yah tells us to do in this verse that you read here is to rightly divide the word and handle it accurately. And in order for us to do that, we have to be willing to seek the truth no matter what. You know, like you said earlier, being humble enough to to openly admit, hey, you know, we're changing our stance on this and here's why. Some some people have a big issue with doing that because they feel like they're admitting a flaw or they're wrong or they made a mistake. Well, you know, we're all just trying to seek the truth and figure out how to follow Yah the way his word says to some things are absolutely clear in scripture, in scripture. Yeah. some things are a little more <clears throat> concealed and you have to do a little more studying uh, and some things you just there's no way to know until messiah returns Amen. you know and so the things like uh biblical new moon you know there's information on it but there, it's one of those things where a lot of people just have come to different opinions and different sides of things and then i do think that like you said there's there's people that are quick to reinvent the wheel, you know, and, and we need to be careful with that as well. And, you know, I've, I've been, I've been guilty of that. I've been guilty of being eager to, you know, reinvent the wheel, so to speak, or find something new in scripture when all along, if like the, the old saying goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You right. Know what I mean, like, if, if it's been done a certain way for, uh, generation after generation after generation for for certain things then it's probably because you know they were given the truth and they know what they're doing as far as judah's concerned and so we're going to get into more of that later but um the key things uh is answering the question what what is biblical new moon and what what has been considered the biblical new moon all throughout history all throughout time we're going to cover um historical support on what the first century jews understood to be new moon what uh ancient uh, mesopotamian cultures understood to be new moon so we'll cover we'll get into some of that first okay we'll, we'll cover some different um commentaries and encyclopedias and, and see what history tells us about biblical new moon <clears throat> excuse me and then we'll get into scripturally what what makes more sense scripturally when we look to the scriptures alone when we look to the verses that that talk about um, new moon, Rosh Kadesh. What what makes more sense for for the the new moon to be announced or to be uh, signified? And so that's that's kind of where we'll go with this. So first, like I said, uh, we'll get into some of the historical support. Uh, the first uh, information I'll read for you guys. Now I'm going to be doing a lot of reading during this. Okay, this is this is more of a presentation of information just to give you guys again evidence of why we believe what we believe and where we stand on the matter. So I'm going to be reading from some notes here that I have for you guys. So the first, the first thing I'll read for you guys is going to be from the philosopher Philo 
And so first century Jewish historian and philosopher Philo records in his writings, the ten, he calls them the ten festivals. And so he goes through his writings, his piece of literature. He was a, he was a Greek philosopher, Hellenistic Jew, who expounded on a lot of things in scripture. And he, you could tell he added his um, Greek philosophy to it because he talks about the ten different feasts, which we know in scripture there's seven feasts. Um, but he, he, he talks about things like every day being a feast, you know, and just different different inputs of his opinions, but he does record history accurately. And so in his writings, he talks about the third festival, which is considered the, the, the new moon. And he says here, he says, the third is that which comes after the conjunction, which happens on the day of the new moon in each month. So here we have a historian, first century BC, meaning before the time of Messiah would have, would have walked the earth, or as, before as Yeshua, common era. yeah, before common era. So we have him recording what the what the the ancient people, the Jews, knew to be biblical new moon. It was the the day which happens after the conjunction. Which so following the order which we have adopted, we proceed to speak of the third festival, that of the new moon. First of all, because it is the beginning of the month, and the beginning, whether the number or of time, is honorable. Secondly, because at this time there is nothing in the whole of the heaven destitute of light. Thirdly, because at that period the more powerful and important body gives a portion of necessary assistance to the less important or weaker body. Now he's talking about the greater light and the lesser light, the sun and the moon, and I'll explain that in a minute. For at the time of the new moon, the sun begins to illuminate the moon with a light which is visible to the outward senses and then she displays her own beauty to the beholders and this is as it seems evident a lesson of kindness and humility to men to humanity. teach them or humanity thank you <laughs> to men to teach them that they should never grudge to impart their own good things to others uh, but imitating the heavenly bodies should drive envy away and banish it from the soul so again he puts his philosophical flavor on his writings but Nevertheless, he records that the practice of the crescent moon after the conjunction, the sliver, like you said, the first sighting to the outward senses, to the physical senses, this is evidence that the method would have been utilized by the Jews in the first century during Messiah's time later, that came later after this, because this is before Messiah's time. This was before the first century uh, CE when uh, Messiah would have been walking the earth with his disciples, teaching and sharing the gospel. Before all of these things happened, the Jews were already keeping the, the biblical new moon a specific way, and here's evidence of that. I mean, we have historic writings from Philo, a trusted source of history by many scholars. I mean, this 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 man has been accredited to be an accurately reporting historian, right? And he's just one of what we're what Anthony's going to be covering on right, historical yeah, the, people who exactly. This is just the first one. So, but the key thing here is. Um, so scripture talks about the, the greater light in Genesis 1 being uh, to rule the day and the lesser light being to rule the night. And so Philo mentions here that during the time of the biblical new moon, um, it's, it's, the, it's the time that nothing in the sky is in darkness. So conjunctionists will say that that's when the new moon is, is that when the, complete, when the sky is in complete darkness, basically, because we know that that's what a conjunction is. It's when everything is lined up and you can't see the moon. It's it's called the dark moon, also. And so, so even in even in uh, I think Enoch, it's called the invisible moon, mm -hmm. or or new birth okay. is what they'll call it. And so he he speaks specifically here that when the sun begins to illuminate the moon, when it's when it begins to bring forth light right. and and it's visible to the naked eye, that is what is called the Rosh Kodesh. The the new moon, the beginning of the month. And so this is how it was kept. And again, like Paul said, this is just one one source here. So again, the 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 light illuminated from the sun to the moon is to be seen with the outward senses, in other words, to the naked eye. Next thing, Flavius Josephus. Were you gonna read that part? You didn't read that part. That's, that's I thought I said that, didn't I say that? Okay. Oh, then I apologize. No, you're good. So let's see. Yeah, so 
This is evidence that this method would have been utilized by the Jews in the first century during Messiah's time and even before him. So like, like I said, I think I said it, maybe not, but Messiah would have also gone by this method to, for the feasts. I mean, Messiah mentioned, Messiah, his disciples, nobody in the Brit Hadashah or anything mentioned anything about um, the moon being kept wrong. I mean, he would. He, right. There's no record of that. Right. There the, was never any rebuking or or anything pertaining to how the beginning of a month would be. I right. mean, it was everybody across the board, even and that's even the pagan nations or or Gentile nations. I mean, everybody was on the same page when it came to all that. And that and that's just it. And that, that that's another thing to consider as well is the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, they all had their different beliefs and their different doctrines. They they debated about a lot of things. The Sadducees uh, didn't believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees did. We see those examples in scripture of disputes, but the moon is never one of them. Never. They are, they all agree on on when Shabbat starts, which you know is, is interesting. Now people are trying to change the time of Shabbat. You know what I mean? And they yeah. they all agree on how to keep biblical new moon and what can, what that is in Scripture. And so again, we not we need to be careful on on jumping on bandwagons of people wanting to reinvent the wheel. Well, it's just like I mean, like the stuff that's been coming out this past year or so that I've seen. You know, people are starting to declare that the full moon is the new moon when right. the moon is full. And it's right. like, like, yeah, okay. reinventing the wheel. Now, here's something that <clears throat> that I found interesting. And you guys, you can you can agree with this or disagree with this study in the scriptures, you know, to, to come to your conclusion. This is just merely for a historical reference. This is written by Flavius Josephus, and he's a first century Jewish historian. We all know the writings of, of Josephus, you know, the, the antiquities of the Jews, the Jewish Roman War, very, very credible, reliable source of history for a lot of scholars, both secular and religious. So um, do your homework on here on this. What Josephus writes, he says, uh, it will be lawful to profane the Sabbath, to travel therein, to give their evidence as to the appearance of the new moon. Why? Because establishing the dates for the feast of the Lord was that important. Josephus indicates once visual confirmation was made, thread and flax were attached to staves of cedar wood, canes and olive branches and lit on fire on the mountaintops around Jerusalem. They were waved repeatedly until someone was spotted on the next mountain. Doing the same thing until the whole country of the captivity appeared like a blazing fire. This right here blew my socks off because this this is one of the things that I had never even learned about before or heard about before until um, Anthony had done dug into this and then a lady a jewish lady in israel when we were there uh she had confirmed it didn't know what he had told me and we her and i got to talking about the moon and stuff and and i told her that i was going by conjunction and she told me almost verbatim about this saying the way that israel used to do it and that and the key thing was once it was cited that they would light these places yeah. all over yeah. that would spread throughout the whole land from Jerusalem out to let everybody know that the new moon has been sighted. Well, obviously we're not sighting an invisible moon, so it had to have been the sliver moon. And and so they, they would light the fire. And, and, and what's, what I find interesting is that same method is used throughout history in ancient cultures for... Um, notifying uh, danger coming, yeah. um, you know, the enemy approaching, yep. different things like that. And that Israel used this method, um, used this method as a means to let the land know that the new moon has been sighted, you know, basically happy <laughs> Rosh Kadesh, you know, exactly. And, and, exactly. and as watchmen, as yep. watchmen on the wall kind of thing as well. And honestly, uh, this is just this is just for me, okay? This is my personal opinion here. Adding my personal opinion, the way he talks about um, being allowed to profane the Sabbath, it kind of reminds me of what Messiah said about how the priests they profane the Sabbath in the temple on Shabbat, but are blameless because it's ministry work. 
I mean, in order for the Israelites to know what times they're in and when to keep the feast and what calendar to go by, I mean, they need to know when Rosh Kodesh is. Like, they need to know, and it was considered a feast. Rosh Kodesh in Torah is considered a feast. There's offerings that need to be made, and we're going to get into that too. And there's trumpets that need to be blown. Like, it, it was considered some kind of minor feast day for them to welcome in the month, the beginning of the well, month. Well, and, and some sects of Judaism also treat it as a Sabbath because of one yeah, particular verse. Exactly. It seems like the verse blends together. It, it, the way that, well, in the English, the verse seems to read that the new moon is as a Sabbath. Yeah. And so some will treat the new moon yep. day yeah. um, when it's sighted, they will that night when it's sighted, they will treat that time as a Sabbath well, uh, and not do any kind of work. Well, and the, things and, like and that. I know you know this verse better, probably better than I do in Ezekiel, where it talks about the, the gate will be open and accessible every, every new moon, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, on new moon and on the Sabbath yes. day. Yes, it, it equate it almost equates the two. Yeah, you know, that's very important times and days. And I've always been curious. That's something I'd like to figure out too. Along the path of this is because if we are supposed to be keeping new moon as a Sabbath, right. I would want to know. Me too. I would want to know. Now, I mean, in in the brief studies that <laughs> I've I've researched and taken back to Hebrew, I've not found anything that that indicates that it is. And but I have not dug into it deep enough to to justifiably say no, it's not a Sabbath, or yes, it is a Sabbath. But I do find it curious because you know, like like you just said, a couple of places tie in to give that indication yeah. of um, yeah, it's it's that, it's that it's it's hard to say because in in Torah we don't have in Leviticus twenty three or anything that talks about it being. Um, you know, a, a solemn feast day or a Shabbat um, where we're required to rest or, or anything. But there are right. there are right. offerings that are to be made. Right. You know, and so for that reason. It is some kind of a, yeah. a, a special day yeah. to some extent. It is. And I think even people uh, will say that historically Israel kept it as that. Like they, they probably didn't work on Rosh Kodesh. They, they gave their offerings. They... They treated it as, uh, you know, like another minor feast day, like we would, like Purim or something, or, uh, you know, something that's celebrated and, and, and given that honor. So, but um, anyway, to keep going with this, did you have anything else or did you want to read it? Okay. Yeah, I was, I wanted to find it. Ezekiel 46, 3. Okay. Uh, well, 1 through 3, it looks like. Um, I wanted to read that real quick just to give that um, what you were just talking about. So, and just to let everybody know, we've already got two parts of videos put together of Rome <laughs> and the journeys of Paul and everything. Um, as everybody knows, my laptop has crashed. Now, my daughter is letting us use hers um, so that we can do this and stuff, but I cannot do what we're doing. So just pray because we've got to figure out a way to get my laptop, re the ministry laptop replaces, you know. So pray about that. Um, let's see. Okay, so Ezekiel 46, the, thus says Yehovah Elohim, starting in verse 1, the gateway of the inner court that faces toward the east shall be shut the six working days, but on the Sabbath it shall be opened, and on the day of the new moon it shall be opened. Yep. Um, let's That's... see. In verse 3, also specific, likewise the people of the land shall worship at the entrance to this gateway before Yehovah on the Shabbats and the new moons. Yep. So obviously that, I mean, I, I don't think Shabbat or New Moon is a Sabbath. <clears throat> Again, I, I'd have to really study it out, but it is held to some sort of special thing um, unto Yah, something that I think that maybe we need to um, get a little deeper into. And and so, yeah, I think that's next on the agenda. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Because like you said, if, if it's regarded as a holy day, then, you know, we want to know about it. So, yeah, amen. Exactly. Um, all right, so the Jewish historian Josephus documents the critical role of the witnesses 
on page 68 or 600 and wow, 685. Sorry, I don't have my glasses, huh? Uh, 685 of his sequel to the history of the Jews. And he says, if a person who was one of the first to see the new moon was physically unable to walk, he was not exempt from the duty to testify about his observation. Instead, he was permitted to ride on an animal, even if the witnesses had to travel on the Sabbath. After the first Babylonian exile, when many Jews that lived in Babylon, the Jewish courts in Jerusalem set up a system to relay confirmation of the new moon so that those in the diaspora knew when to keep the holy days. As Josephus records, that would, they would light fires on hilltops, uh, signaling to others that would trigger a chain reaction of giant signal fires all throughout the land, just as we had talked about. They were called signal fires. And we have an actual example of signal fires being used in scriptures. Like you said, they're, they were used as a form of warning or alert. Well, it wasn't any different for, for Israel because in Jeremiah 6.1 it says, O oh, you children of Benjamin, gather yourselves to flee from the midst of Jerusalem. Blow the trumpet in Tekoa, and set up signal fire in Beth Hakarem, for disaster appears out of the north and great destruction. <laughs> so they, they use these systems, yeah. and we have it here recorded in Scripture. Uh, they use the signal fires for different things, and one of those things it's recorded in history by Josephus and others was to call the, the recognition for the new moon Amen. to begin the celebration and the feast. All right, so I won't read this part. Keep going. You're not reading that part? No, I'm not reading that part. Okay. Um, unless you want me to. I, I can mention it briefly. Uh, let's see. Well, go, scroll back up because I want to I want to mention one thing. Out of okay, it. okay. Okay, so one of the things, now everybody knows that in our ministry we do not, I even, we, Mishnah, Talmud, all of that, it is not the writings of Yah. Um, and we know a lot of Messianic congregations have began to adopt uh, yeah. weaving in parts of that. And they hold it equal following, to Yah's word. Yeah, and, and it is not. It's not Yah's word. It's not Yah's word. And, oh, by the way, did I say it's not Yah's word? Amen. But as a historical <laughs> reference yeah. and an understanding of the practices of Judaism, and I don't mean historical as a means of correct historical documentation, but to understand why the Jews do certain things the way they do in Judaism, this is the only reason why I'm sharing this. Mishnah records the practice of the witnesses for the new moon in the second temple period. Israel will have, has to be two or three witnesses, typically three. Um, there's even a website um, that Anthony um, keeps tabs on. I can't remember the name of it, but they will not declare to the world a new moon that they do they follow the new moon by jerusalem but they wait until that there have been three recognized witnesses in israel they don't typically go by just jerusalem they'll go from anywhere in israel that say new moon has been sighted yeah. and if they get three witnesses in that night then they'll they'll announce it on their side to the world um, and this came from Mishnah. This comes from Judaism practice that that uh, Mishnah records the practice of the witnesses for the new moon and second temple period. It once happened that Tobias, as the physician, saw the Kodesh in Jerusalem together with his son and his emancipated slave, the priests, Sadducees, accepted the testimony of Tobias and his son, but rejected the testimony of of his slave, and this is all Mishnah stuff. Right. Um, so, so this is where typically this is why you'll this is where that practice comes from. And when you hear or see people who are saying they're waiting for the two or three witnesses in Jerusalem or in Israel to sight the new moon, that's what that's where that practice comes from. Is from is Mishnah uh, teaching in Judaism. Right. You see the new moon, and so some of you may have a question. So are we supposed to go by the siding of Jerusalem or, or what? Well, if you don't live in Jerusalem, there's no need for you to go by the siding in Jerusalem because otherwise, if you, now, if you choose to, that's your choice, and you have to base it based on whether they actually are seeing it or not. You have to decide whether you're believing whoever's declaring it to be telling the truth. 
but the simplicity of it is nowhere in scripture does it say that you can only go new moon based on Jerusalem. It doesn't say that anywhere. So if you live clearly on the other side of the planet and for you, like those in America right now, it's y'all just woke up an hour or two ago. It's seven, eight, nine o'clock in the morning for y'all. And it's already sundown here in Italy and Israel's an hour ahead of us. So if new moon was right now, obviously that, you know, that wouldn't be for you, but most likely you'll see new moon tonight at sundown for you guys if this was the night of new moon to be to be sighted mm -hmm. so you know just keep it simple don't 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 make don't stress it yourself out and if you want to do it that way then do it because you want to don't do it because somebody says you have to because that's the part that's wrong it doesn't declare it in scripture that you can only go by new moon sighting in israel no matter where you're at it doesn't say that go by it where you live now, if you want to do it by Israel, fine, go ahead. But do it because you want to. Don't do it because some rabbi or your pastor or somebody says you have to or you're doing it wrong because that's not true. Yeah. I just want to put that part in there. So the the story that Paul, a little bit of the story that Paul read in Mishnah, basically it's just used to show that um, throughout Mishnah, we know that it's commentary and it's a lot of debates between Pharisees and Sadducees. They debated about everything. I mean, there's a lot of things that they, that they disagreed on and they debated about and that's what a lot of mission is is recorded midrashes but as i said earlier the moon and how how to determine rosh kadesh is not one of them they agreed that's the key thing here of uh, bringing that story in is they did not disagree on what what uh, constituted a new moon they did exactly. not disagree on that that was there was never a debate about no, it that was already settled just like there was never a debate on when shabbat started i mean it's it's one of those things that everybody has always had an understanding from history from the past of how to do certain things and and you know mishpaha scripture says there's nothing new under the moon and, and basically essentially in all manner of speaking that's true but there are some things that are just like i said people trying to reinvent the wheel this new moon or this like Shabbat starts at sunrise and stuff like that. You will not find any historical documentation on that. I've never found right, exactly. anything historical no. that shows that anybody never. ever practiced this no. in the past. No. Uh, same with the with the moon thing, you know. Um, By the way, he said nothing new under the moon because of the did teaching. I say that? that? We're just yeah, because of the teaching. That's why. Did I just say that? <laughs> uh, yeah, that Go too. Away, man. Yeah, Go yeah, away. yeah. That's right, man. Uh -huh. Yeah, I knew what I was talking about. All right, yeah. So, no. um, also, uh, the the mission also records the uh, the kind of the what's called the default process, where we know that. Um, astronomically, there's 29 and a half days in the lunar cycle, right? right? There's 29 and a half days, no more, no less. And so, um, so what happens if we get to the 29th day of... And it's really cloudy and you can't and see And you can't spark. see the moon. Well, well, the mission records a process that no matter what, on the 29th day, if the new moon has not been spotted, then you automatically declare new moon on the 30th day of the month. You cannot have... No, uh, according to uh, the lunar cycle, you cannot have no more than 30 days in a lunar cycle. Um, and so that's what they considered to be a Hebrew biblical month, was a month that consisted of 30 days max. Because the that's, moon... That's why there's only 360 days. days in a in a true... In a biblical calendar, there's 360 days. Right. Not 364, 365, or whatever the Enoch calendar has as well. Right. That's why none of that works. And... Right. Um, and that's historically been kept that way forever. Yeah. Which also and it works. Yeah. Which also I know a lot of, uh, I mean, I, I was, I was one of the, the, the people who, who used first Samuel chapter 20 to, to promote the conjunction and, and say that it makes more sense because of a teaching that I had heard and the way that it looked in scripture. But here's the thing about it is if we only listen to people, who are trying to reinvent the wheel, people who are teachers in, in the Torah that 
are like first generation or, or who really don't try to study out historical uh, Jewish culture and things of, of why people do what they do and why it's been done a certain way throughout all of time, then it, it's easy to just reinvent the wheel. And so if we take the understanding of having the default day process of the lunar cycle only being 29 and a half days, and if you don't see the new moon by then, then automatically the 30th day is going to be uh, the the new moon, the, the new moon day. If we take that understanding of, of history and how they did things, and it makes sense as to why David and Jonathan would have understood that the, ne the new moon day is going to be the next day, because it would have been on the 29th day of the month when he was in the field and when they were going to send David to hide from Saul for the new moon feast was upon them. And they knew for certain, he said, to, he, they declared, tomorrow is the new moon. And so go and hide until the third day at evening. Well, you have three days that really are considered. The invisible moon cycle part, yeah. Well, you have three days that they would have been getting ready to celebrate okay so you had the 28th day which because the 28th day of the month you were looking for the moon that night so it could have possibly been that night that started new moon day um if if the new moon hadn't come that night then the 29th day you were still looking for the new moon that night because and when you've kept it this way for generation after generation after generation i mean it was right. easy Right, and, and, and so that would have been two days already that they would have been waiting for the new moon to appear. And also, so if you finally arrive to the 29th day, still no new moon for whatever reason, it's cloudy or it, whatever, uh, automatically you know that the 30th day has to be declared new moon and thus the day, the third day of watch for the new moon. And after the, the new moon arrives, whether you see it or not, on the 30th day, that whole day, the next day is going to be a celebration. And that's what they were doing. They were feasting. They were celebrating. And that's why he said, you know, don't, don't come back until the end of the third, of the third day, basically. Um, and Saul was enraged, we know, when he saw David wasn't there. But people will argue, conjunctionists will argue, uh, and I used to be one of them, uh, well, because conjunction lasts two and a half days, therefore that means then that has to be the conjunction. But we don't consider the history. Right. That's where we miss. That's right. where we misinterpret things. Yeah. Is if we don't consider the history of how they did things and the system that's already been in place for thousands of years, then it's easy for us to interject what we think it is or what we think it should be. And I guilt again. I, I'm guilty of that. I've done that. You know what I mean? It was it was a, a easy misunderstanding, and I know a lot of people still use that verse to do that. And so we need to study to show ourselves approved, like it says in Timothy. And right. and it and be willing to admit if we find you know a revelation of new information. Um, okay, so next one is from the Encyclopedia Britannica, and again, this is this is another source that just shows that it wasn't just the Israelites that kept the 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 lunar solar calendar this way. It was multiple ancient cultures. So it says, uh, the lunar solar calendar, which utilized the crescent new moon, dates all the way back to ancient Sumerian civilizations. That's, even before that's, Babylon. yeah, that's, pre I was just going to say, that's pre-Babylon, and it says it right there. I mean, right. Sumerian is believed to be one of the first yep. um, civilizations. civilizations in history. Yep. Um, I mean, there's been all kinds of, you know, debates about, the Sumerian writings as right. far as like on a scriptural level and stuff. But right. yeah, I mean, yeah. you're talking about, man, as far back to the beginning as you can get. Yeah. So uh, this calendar method was also used by the Assyrians and other surrounding civilizations. Now, let me say something real quick on that. Go ahead. So if you, if you date back all the way to the beginning, the very first empire was the Assyrian empire. You had the Assyrian Empire, then the Egyptian Empire, then the Babylonian, then the Medo-Persian, then Greece, Rome, so on and so forth. The very first empire was the Assyrian Empire, um, which was right after the Sumerian civilization. Mm -hmm. So it says, uh, present, and this is an entry that uh, we just put in here from Encyclopedia Britannica. All these, all these entries, you guys can go and validate them for yourselves, go and validate the sources of the writings of Philo, the writings of Josephus, the entry in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, this, this is stuff you guys can read for yourself. It says, 
Um, present knowledge of the Jewish calendar in use before the period of the Babylonian exile is both limited and uncertain. The Bible refers to calendar matters only incidentally, and dating of components of Mosaic law or the Torah remains doubtful. The earliest debatable datable. or datable, thank you. The earliest datable source for the Hebrew calendar is the Gezer calendar, um, and and that's actually a place in Israel, Ge uh, Gezer, that Solomon had reign over. Uh, written probably in the age of Solomon in the late 10th century BCE, the inscription indicates the length, and they actually found this. Uh, this it's a stone, or like, like almost like a, a rock or a tablet. Uh, it's it's a fraction of the the Gezer calendar. So the Israelites had a calendar set in place even during the time of King Solomon and King David. They already had it already set. Uh, it says. Um, the inscription indicates the length of main agricultural tasks within the cycle of 12 lunations. The, which is 12 months. The calendar term here is Yereah, which in Hebrew denotes both moon and month. The second Hebrew term for month, Hodesh, properly means the newness of the lunar crescent. Thus, the Hebrew months were lunar, and they are not named in pre-exilic sources uh, except in the biblical report of the building of Solomon's temple in Jerusalem in 1 Kings, uh, where the names of three months, two of them also attested in the Phoenician calendar, are given. The months are usually numbered rather than named. The beginning of the months was the month of Passover. Uh, so see also in Judaism, the cycle of the religious year. In some passages, the Passover month is that of Hodesh Ha'aviv, so the month of Ha'aviv, of the Aviv. Is what's and that's in it, that's in Deuteronomy sixteen one Exodus twelve right. um, the lunation that coincides with the barley being in the ear. Thus, the Hebrew calendar is tied in with the course of the sun, which determines ripening of the grain. It is not known how the lunar year of three hundred and fifty four days was adjusted to the solar year of three hundred sixty five days. The Bible never mentions inter intercalation yeah. Yeah. intercalation sorry yeah. about that the year shana properly change of seasons was the agricultural and thus liturgical year there is no reference to the new year's day in the bible so so this is basically telling us that the pre-exilic geezer calendar of solomon would have used as it said earlier like every other culture did every other culture shared um, certain understandings of how to do things because they have the knowledge of how to keep track of these times, how to watch the moon. Um, it even said that some of the months were similar between the different societies with Israel and, and the Sumerians, um, that the crescent moon was to determine the new months, just as many other ancient cultures did in, in ancient Mesopotamia. And so, I mean, this guys, this is, this is, what what people have been doing for thousands of years yeah you know why would it change <laughs> all of a sudden out of nowhere why why would well it, not just that but i mean it's just there's there's too much evidence historically and biblically and that's key mishbaha i mean obviously scripture trumps everything scripture is to be held as as truth above all else okay. but both both uh, back each other up Amen. in this. All right, so two more, uh, actually, let's see. Yeah, two more references here, and then we'll get into the scriptures. Okay, and so this is from, uh, so Michael Houdman's uh, Calvary Theological Seminary, and he gives a pretty good entry on the history <clears throat> of Rosh, Rosh Chodesh, or the biblical new moon. And he says in his in his entry, he says the significance of the new moon in Bible times is that it marked the beginning of the new month. A Hebrew calendar is lunar based, and it was the time when the Israelites were to bring an offering to God. The beginning of the month was known not by astronomical calculations, but by the testimony of messengers appointed to watch for the first physical physical appearance of the new moon. As soon as the first sliver was seen. The fact was announced throughout the whole country by signal fires on the mountaintops and the blowing of trumpets. The Hebrew word for month, Chodesh, literally means new moon. In Numbers 20 and 11, the new moon offering is commanded for the first time. On the first of every month, present to present, present to uh, the Lord a burnt offering of two young bulls, one ram, and seven male lambs, a year old, 
all without defect. Each of the animal sacrifices was to be accompanied by a grain offering and a drink offering, uh, verses 12 through 14. In addition to burnt offerings, a goat was to be sacrificed to the Lord as a sin offering in verse 15. So the new moon festival marked the consecration of God of each new month in the year. New moon festivals were marked by sacrifices, the blowing of trumpets over the sacrifices, and it says that in Numbers 10.10, 10, uh, the suspension of all labor and trade, uh, Nehemiah 10.31, and social or family feasts uh, in 1 Samuel 25, talking about the, the feast that Saul and David and them would have had. So it really is. I mean, it may not be like a... Uh, a set biblical feast right. in the sense like Pesach to Sukkot is, but it was something it was that recognized. God gave and recognized. It was, I mean, every month they brought an offering to Yeah, God. it was like the first fruits of the month. Yeah, you know exactly. So welcome they, in the new month. Yeah, because it had to be a year old with that mm -hmm. blemish, mm -hmm. and it was, man. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so the last last um, historical reference we have here is, is uh, by a, a book that I have. It's called Alfred Edersheim's The Temple Ministry and Its Services. Great book. Um, I got it pretty cheap on Kindle if you guys are interested in that. Um, and this is from Chapter 15 when he talks about the temple services and the sighting of the new moon. And it says, The determination of the new moon, we have already shown of what importance the right determination of the new moon was in fixing the various festivals of the year and with what care and anxiety its appearance was ascertained from witnesses who actually had seen it. Also, how tidings were, were afterwards communicated to those at a distance. For the new moon was reckoned by actual personal observation, not by astronomical calculation, with which, however, as we know, many of the rabbis must have been familiar since we read of astronomical pictures by which they, by which they were wont to test the veracity of witnesses. Uh, so important was it deemed to have faithful witnesses that they were even allowed in order to reach Jerusalem in time to travel on the Sabbath and, if necessary, to make use of horse or mule. And then he gives a mission of citation uh, while strict rules determined who were not uh, to be admitted to uh, as witnesses, every encouragement was given to trustworthy persons, and the Sanhedrin provided for them a banquet in a large building, especially designed or destined for that purpose, and known as Bet Yaazek. And so, Josephus, um, two other um, theological sources, uh, Philo. Uh, the Mishnah, all of these, all these different um, sources of literature, all giving witness to the signal fires, and all the way back to the uh, Sumerian. Yeah, the, and the the, the yeah exactly Sumerian. the Sumerians, the the Culture. the Assyrians, the pre pre Babylonian societies, all using um, the sliver to signify the beginning of their months, and so you know I, I think. I think some people are hesitant to want to accept what's already been set in place because we get into the mindset of, oh, well, if they use it, then it's pagan. You know, it's, it's wrong. It's bad. You know, but it's like, who created the signs in the sky in the first place? Sure. Right? Yehovah did. You know, Yah is the one who put the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars he made also. And so all of these things he put into place for for mankind to understand the times, the seasons, the days, the months, and years. It specifically says that in Genesis 1, guys. Like, that's what they're there for. And so for us to say, well, we can't use the new moon's litter because, you know, this these people, they use it and they're pagan or right. they, this, their yeah. symbol and they're, they're, you know, evil or whatever. It's like that's, that's like saying we can no longer have a shirt with a rainbow on it because all the homosexuals use right. it now. I mean, exactly. It's ridiculous. All right, so... Um, to wrap this up, we'll go over some scripture, all right? So some scriptural imp implications for crescent observance, okay? Deuteronomy 16.1, as we mentioned earlier, says, observe the month of Aviv, or uh, observe Chodesh Ha'aviv, basically is, is how it reads in the Hebrew. It says, and keep the Passover to Yehovah your Elohim, for in the month of Aviv, Yehovah your Elohim brought you out of the land of Egypt. It's by looking at these terms, observe and month, a little closer in the Hebrew that we can find their meaning from a Hebraic perspective in regard to the new month or the new moon. What, what 
this actually is talking about here. So the phrase observe um, in the month of Aviv is written in the Hebrew, Shamar et Kodesh, Shamar. And what does Shamar mean, brother? Shamar means to guard. Exactly. Shamar comes from the Hebrew word Shamar, which means guardian. Yes. Um, um, protector. Yes. Yes. That's one of my favorite words. So it's also the same word that is talked about to guard the Shabbat. To, exactly. To keep it. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. My wife just piped in nice. about it being a derivative of the word shalom. Also, Shiloh comes from that same word as well. Okay. So, awesome. yeah, all of that ties in together. Awesome. And all come from the root word shalom. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, other other examples of how it's used throughout Scripture, and these are this is from the Brown Driver Briggs, um, the Strong's, Two different um, lexicons and, and uh, uh, concordances used to show you guys that the the way that the scripture interprets shamar, uh, like you said, is to guard, to observe, to give heed, to have charge, or to keep watch um, and war to protect. This is how the Browns driver breaks breaks. Down. I love the Browns driver breaks. It even says to save life. To to be a watchman. Well, now uh, yeah, to guard, yeah. <laughs> to, to watch for, and then also um, in the strong to wait for, to wait to, for, to retain, obs to observe. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, it says shamar et kodesh to wait for, to even to perform, to to observe. So yeah. they're observing, and then here um, it also says here. Let's see. In the Strong's definition, it, it talks about, it's very similar, to protect, to attend to, to take heed, to keep or mark, look narrowly. That's one that I find very interesting, to look narrowly for, to look narrowly. Um, observe, preserve, reserve, all of these things very, very um, similar to each other from the Strong's, from the, the Brown Driver Briggs of what this word shamar is expressing in the scriptures. Now. Let's see. So we read all this already. Okay, to keep, to guard. So through both lexicons, we find them equally placing emphasis on guarding, keeping, watching, um, protecting, looking narrowly, waiting for. So Deuteronomy 16.1 is commanding Israel to keep watch or look narrowly for the month or the new moon of Aviv. So it's in close observation. So they're waiting for this. So they're looking for this. They're watching. They're looking narrowly for the, the, the new moon, Rosh Chodesh, the beginning of the month. So, again, keep watch for what? Look narrowly for what? Exactly. <laughs> right? Like how, how the key are, thing is you're looking for something. Exactly. I believe the historical records tell us that they were keeping watch for the first sight of light, the light from the new moon. I mean, it just it just makes sense. It does. It just makes sense when you think about it, it like really that. It really does. All right. So the next the next part of the phrase is kodesh. We have the phrase in Deuteronomy sixteen one kodesh. Remember, it said shamar et kodesh. So the outline of the biblical usage is the new moon month, um, monthly first day of the month or the lunar month. Um, so that's in the the outline of biblical usage. It also is the the new moon by implication new moon the root word of kodesh is hadash and the outline of hadash is to be new renew repair or to renew to make a new to repair to renew one's self all right and again this hadash is the strongs defines that as to be new causively to rebuild or to renew or repair so with the word Kadash meaning, or excuse me, Kodesh meaning month or new moon, it's literally derived from the root word Kadash, okay, which means to be new or renewed, so to, or to make a new. With this understanding, then we can say that Deuteronomy 16.1, where Israel is being told, is being commanded to keep watch for the renewed moon, the renewed moon, the repaired moon of the Aviv, for this shall be your beginning of months. So... The renewed moon, the first sight of the moon's life would be the, the sliver. 
the cre the crescent. Yeah. Because during the conjunction, the moon is being renewed. It's right. the process. It's being born. Yeah. It's it's the process of the renewal. Right. And so when it begins, is evidenced by the first sign of light. All right. Further support that Chodesh represents the new moon in scripture is the fact that Chodesh and the word Yara are used all throughout scripture to describe the moon or month. And yet Chodesh has a specific connotation to the beginning of the month. This implies Chodesh is referring to the new month or new moon. So we'll look at a few verses that show that. Exodus 12, 1 through 2. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So Yehovah said in this to Israel, Chodesh, or renewed moon, shall be your beginning of new moons, declaring the beginning of the year, which we know um, from there you count 14 days until you get Passover. So the, the, re, the, the renewed moon of Aviv, the renewed moon of Ha-Aviv, the Aviv is what this verse is talking about here. So to start your beginning of months, you, you need to have, one, you need to have the springtime with us, which the springtime isn't going to come until we have the signs in the sky, the, the, the sun and everything in the sky that needs to be in the position that it, it needs to be for spring, which is used by the equinox. I mean, let's just, let's just be honest here. Like the spring comes after the spring equinox. Right. I mean, that's why it's called that. The different, the different cycles of the has sun. has nothing to do with paganism. No, but the different cycles of the sun of where it's at with relation to the earth, that's what's determined for the seasons. And so, after the spring equinox is what it's called, everything starts to begin to ripen, to bloom. The right. spring comes in. That's and why the first new moon, the, 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 the sighting of the sliver moon, um, even if you did conjunction, the first new moon after the spring equinox always falls right in line with the beginning of the biblical calendar each year yes. always and it's called every single year i've done this for over 12 years mm -hmm. and every single year it has always been right on the money everything has always fell right on time mm -hmm. um with the the sighting of the barley the yes. rising of the vive everything it always nails it right on time yep again it always they're all witnesses to each other the signs in the sky give witness to the signs of the earth um, the barley is another thing that you mentioned. I mean, it always they always coincide with each other. They always give witness to each other. The moon, the sun, the stars. Um, you know, we the the different constellations in the stars. If you study them, if you study a little bit of astronomy and the celestial bodies, they are positioned in specific ways throughout the different seasons of the year. They 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 are positioned. You can see uh, certain star constellations better. At the beginning of the spring and the spring equinox, at the at the winter solstice, all these things, and so you can't tell me that the ancient people, the ancient Hebrews, didn't understand these things. I mean, they would have known to look to the sky for the signs. They would have known to look um, to what Yah put in place for what for times and seasons, Amen. for appointed times. The greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars He made also, so that the people on the earth could understand what time of the year it was, how to count their days, how to count their months. And the first month of the Aviv barley in the springtime, after the spring equinox, like he said, would be the, the, the head of the year, the beginning of months, the, the new moon of all new moons. So that's what we're saying here in Exodus 12, uh, 1 through 2. Did you want to add anything else to that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Exodus, next one we'll go to is... Um, Exodus 13, 4, and it says, On this day you are going out in the month of Aviv. So in the Hebrew, this verse uh, read, Kodesh ha, Kodesh ha Aviv, to literally mean the new moon of the Aviv, referencing the ripened barley being an additional witness for the time of the biblical New Year, which is what we just said. Uh, Numbers 10, 10, it says, Also in the day of, glad of your gladness and your appointed feast, and at the beginning of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and your sacrifices of, pe of your peace offerings, and they shall be a memorial before you, uh, before your Elohim. I am Yehovah, your Elohim. Um, so on the, on, on the Chodesh, the renewed moon, the priest was to blow the trumpet, this being the silver trumpet designated for the priest, and it's called the, uh, help me out with that, Hatso, hatso, tessera. Hatso, tessera. hatso tessera. 
um, the priests were uh, commanded to blow these as well as present the offerings. So it was some sort of feast gathering. If they're presenting offerings, if they're blowing the silver trumpets, okay, Psalm 83, 1 through 4, okay, it says, Sing aloud to Elohim our strength. Make a joyful shout to Elohim of Yaakov. Raise a song and strike the timbrel, the pleasant harp with the lute. Blow the trumpet at the time of the new moon, at the full moon on our solemn feast day. For this is a statute for Israel, a Torah of the Elohim of Jacob. So the so for the full moon here, the word is used as uh, kasi, and is you kase, yeah. kasi, kase, and is used only twice in the Tanakh. Proverbs seven twenty uses kase as appointed time. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean full moon. It, it's it's like he just said, appointed time. Right, and the other translations, uh, such as the King James version, and other use as appointed time in Psalms eighty one verse three instead of full moon. Kase is widely debated amongst scholars. There, uh, there's an admittance of uncertainty from many biblical lexicons and dictionaries regarding its origins, determining if it's Hebrew or Aramaic origin. The Aramaic language defines Kese as full moon, hence that's how we see it in Psalms 81.3. It's translated as full moon in some versions here. Yet others asserted that it's Hebrew in origin, stemming from the root word kasa, which means covering or concealment. And that's where conjunctions will say, you see, this means a point in time, which is uh, during the time of covering or concealment, and it has to be the conjunction. Many have taken this verse and claimed that it's referring to the new moon day, and kese or kasa covering is evidence for conjunction. Others have asserted that kese is the full moon and we must have 100% full moon on certain feast days such as Passover and Sukkot, which I believed that at one time. Yeah, but scripture doesn't teach that. Exactly. I was just going to read that. The scripture doesn't assert that anywhere. That there has to be a that full has been, moon. That's been an asserted assumption because yeah. I was on the same boat with that. But nowhere does it say that Pesach, or actually Matzo, which is on the 15th day of the month, that it has to be full moon. It's It's been a, a asserted assumption that that it has to be because it's on the 15th day of the month. Well, that doesn't mean that the 15th day of the month is required full moon status. And that was one of the things that messed me up in the past because of that mindset and and why I had gone to conjunction moon for the for a while is because I had had that same thought in my mind that okay middle of the month means full moon. Well, scripture nowhere in scripture does it assert that. Nowhere does it hint that. Nowhere does it say that. It just talks about our full moons and our not even the word full our moon feast our moon appointed moon feast exactly and new moon feast exactly. and. Um, and, and so if it's the 15th day of the month, then it's the 15th day of the month from the sighting of the sliver. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Right. So that's it. Numbers, no, no add, no take away, nothing else. That's, that's all it is. Amen. Numbers 10, 10 gives us evidence <clears throat> that Psalms 83, one is not speaking of the regular moon or beginning of the month because of the trumpets indicated here is completely different. Now listen to this. Shofar or ram's horns uh, is used in Psalm 81 and Hatzotesra for silver trumpets of the priests is used in Numbers 10. There's a difference there. So what feast is Psalms 81.3 speaking of when it calls for blowing of trumpets? What feast are we told is the day of the blast? The Yom day of Shuruah. trumpets. Yom Shuruah. So I believe that's what this verse is saying here, is to blow the shofar on your feast day, Yom Shuruah. Right. The feast day of Yom Shuruah when, it's, when, it's, when it commemorates the day of the blast, the day of the blowing of shofars when, when the Israelites throughout numerous times with Joshua, with um, Gideon, they were delivered at the sound of a shofar blast and how Yeshua himself will come at the, sh at the sound of the last trumpet, the last shofar. So... I, I personally believe that that's what Psalms 81.3 is telling us, is to blow the shofar, blow the ram's horn on our feast day, um, which is Yom Teruah. So because the silver trumpets are what's supposed to be blown on um, Rosh, Rosh Kodesh. Thus, it would make sense to translate this verse 
as other Bibles do, different translations do. It says, blow the shofar at the Chodesh at the appointed time, our solemn feast day. And we know when is Yom Teruah? It's on a new moon, right? Always. Yeah. It's and, always that's, and that's the thing, too. And that's, it's the one feast you never know um, the day or hour right. until you sight. And that's, that's why, uh, me personally, I'm not speaking for anybody else, but that's why people like me believe that Yeshua is going to return on the Feast of Yom Teruah because it literally is a feast that you don't know of the day or hour. Because until the new moon is sighted, the sliver moon is sighted, nobody knows when Yom Teru starts. Right. And so, um, so yeah, so, I mean. Amen. So they would have been blowing the shofar. They would have been actually, correction for myself, they would have been blowing both, all of them. They would have been blowing um, the, if it were Yom Teru, they would be blowing the silver trumpets because of new moon, and they would be blowing shofars, right? Everyone would be blowing ram's horns. Everyone would be blowing all the all of the trumpets throughout the land, just like just like they've always done. Um, but on new moon specifically, it talks about in Numbers ten the, for the silver trumpets, the uh, the chas uh, tot the silver trumpets for the elders. And but on Yom Teruah, which is what I believe Psalm uh, eighty one three talks about, is all of the shofars, everything, the, the ram's horns, everything. Amen. So, um, so it says here, even if we use the translation concealment or covering, it would still be referring to Yom Teruah because, as Paul just said, the moon is technically concealed during this time with only a slight sliver or crescent being used to determine the feast day. So you don't know until until it's the exact day. You don't know um, exactly when it is until you finally see the actual sliver. So it says um, in uh, Numbers 28.11, At the beginning of your Kodesh, you shall present a burnt offering to Yehovah, two young bulls, one ram, and seven lambs in the year, in their first year, without blemish. The practice of, of witnesses, the sight of the new moon each month, um, was the same for Yom Shrua. They had to find the crescent. They needed to be able to identify these things with reliable witnesses. Last few verses here, uh, Numbers 29.6. Besides the burnt offering with its grain offering uh, for the Chodesh, the regular burnt offering with its grain offering and their drink offerings according to their ordinance as a sweet aroma an offering made by fire to Yehovah. So just showing you guys, um, you know, this this was considered a time where offerings were made, where, where they gathered together. The, the verses uh, refer to new moons and Sabbaths and all use the word Kodesh. Isaiah 1.13, Isaiah 66.23, Hosea 2.11, Amos 8.5. Shamar et Kodesh in Deuteronomy 16.1 tells us to look narrowly or keep watch for the Kodesh, the nude moon, or the renewed moon properly. So the renewed moon has historically been recognized as the crescent after the conjunction, as all the historical evidence in the beginning of this presentation has pointed to and said. Now, while the moon is in its dark phase or its conjunction, when it's not visible, it is in the process of being renewed, as we just said. The first sight of light is and has always been considered the renewed moon by the Hebrews and many other ancient civilizations such as uh, the Sumerians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians. The Hebrews were to diligently watch for the first sight of the crescent. Furthermore, I believe the argument can be made for the new moon beginning in light rather than darkness is if we examine where it all began in Genesis 1 verses 14 through 18. Um, these verses uh, concentrate on specific patterns of giving light. Genesis 1 14 through 18. Then Elohim said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then Elohim made two lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Elohim set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and to rule over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And Elohim saw that it was good. All creations in the sky, all of it. The sun, the moon, and the stars were set in place for one purpose, to bring forth light. 
Exactly. To bring forth light upon the earth. They were, to, they were placed in the sky to act as signs or marks for the appointed times in the appointed seasons for days, for months, for years. Again, that's what makes sense. If we're not trying to um, add anything or, or create anything new, that's that's what makes sense. I mean, even the word uh, light in, in the, the, the Hebrew in Genesis is ma'or. And this even means um, a luminous body or luminary, brightness, cheerfulness, specifically bright, a bright light. So if the moon is meant to bring forth light, then why would it, why would just just think about that logically for a second? Why would the declaration of a new moon be darkness? Right. It just it doesn't right. make it doesn't make sense if you think about it from a Hebraic perspective and you consider the history. It just it doesn't make sense. So all of these things they point to the moon bearing light to be signified as new. Uh, Psalm one thirty six nine: The moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures forever. Psalm 148.3, praise him, sun and moon, praise him, all you stars of light. Ecclesiastes 12.2, while the sun and the light, while the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened, and the clouds do not return after the rain. Isaiah 13.10, for the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened and it's grown forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. That's during the time. Of, times, yes, yeah, that's during, that's during. That's the only time that we'll see. And it's specific. I think. I think that's interesting. That it 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 speaks on that. It's like Yah is saying that all the light that I've set in the skies for for everything is is going to be hidden. Mm -hmm. It's going to be covered. It's going to be lost because of the darkness and the wickedness that's going to engulf this earth during the time of tribulation. Yeah. And that's, that's, I mean, that's interesting that you put it that way because, you know, people, we've, we've kind of seen people reinvent the wheel and create new things. And, and it's kind of reversed what, what, what we believe Yah intended Rosh Kodesh to be as signified by the first sign of light. Well, now, now there's so many people out there that have been doing it for how long would you say? 20 years, 30 years, maybe longer. Um, but maybe no more than 30, 40 years. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. Um, they, I could see. they reinvented the wheel of, of calling Rosh Kodesh something that's signified by darkness. I mean, yeah. when in Isaiah it says that there's going to be a time when the moon becomes dark and the sun becomes dark and the stars become dark and it's going to be during a time of judgment yeah. <laughs> and yeah. a time of wrath. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. So I think, I think the correlation of everything coming together is also a part of what really makes it clear. And, you know, I, I've, I'm looking at some of the comments on here and stuff. And, you know, just understand, Ms. Baha, we're, we're not. I personally, there is. New Moon is not a salvation if, issue. Whether you believe in conjunction or sliver is not going to determine whether you go to heaven or hell. Um, the point is, is that we're studying this out to show ourselves approved and with the evidences of everything that we see, um, I have never seen presented any, anything strong enough or anywhere near the amount of stuff of even what Anthony has shown here that would back up conjunction. Um, you know, I, I think that Sliver Moon definitely um, is shown throughout the scriptures and historically in every way, shape, and form. Um, for us here at SY7 Ministry, this is our stance, and, and this, is, this is how we will proceed forward from here on out in this. Um, uh, you know, but it doesn't change anything of whether or not, you know, whether it, if you agree with us, awesome. If you don't agree with us, Awesome. Right. Go study it out for yourself. We're not trying to tell you, hey, if you don't listen to us here, then you got it wrong. That's not what we're saying. We we weren't that way even when we thought conjunction moon was the way to go. Right. Um, this is all a part of learning for everybody. We we never stop learning. We right. never stop learning. And I mean, I've been in ministry for over fifteen years. I've been a pastor for fifteen years. I, I mean, I've studied the Bible my whole life, off and on. And what I thought I knew 30 years ago, 
changed a lot to what I know today. And, and when I thought I knew when I was in the church, definitely changed a lot when I came to keeping Torah. And, and so as we grow and we learn and as we seek things out, some things maybe we don't, we don't think important enough. We don't, we don't seek into it deep enough. And then down the road, Yah decides, okay, you know, it's time for you to give a little more focus to this. And I think that's what's happened here. This was a stirring on Anthony's heart and, and all of us, Anthony and Robert and James and myself and my wife and, um, you know, uh, some people who follow this ministry, they've, they've loved everything that, that we teach, but um, they disagreed with us on the conjunction moon and we're very happy when they found out that we, <laughs> that we um, uh, are, are on the sliver moon and, you know, but everything's learning, everything's growing. I think sometimes you can get to dissecting something too much and then you just lose the whole thing and then you start making things fit that aren't even there you start putting things in that aren't even there but that's something you got to work out for yourself right but um and that's basically everything i mean we we showed we showed the historical evidence of um philo uh i mean a first century bc um historian giving record of of his recordings of the feast days and how new moon was kept um, Josephus also, Flavius Josephus, early um, first and second century Jewish historian doing the same thing, uh, you know, different accounts through different encyclopedia entries by people who have done way more extensive studies than any of us. Um, and even things that hinted all the way back to the Sumerian time. I right. Mean, right. You know, it's just... And then the script, the patterns we see in scripture that just it just makes it just makes more sense to me. I mean, and does okay. So does scripture flat out say go look for the sliver moon? No, it doesn't. But here's where process of elimination comes in. When you pay attention to the wording, how things are spoken, how things are related, and in the breakdown and definitions of words, then then it just it becomes a common sense thing uh, to me in this area. And I'm not saying that those who keep conjunction or don't have common sense. That's not what I'm saying. To me in this, now that I have seen all of this evidence and all of this stuff that I believe to be um, uh, convincing, to me, the wording of Scripture in the Hebrew as well as in the English, to me it makes it clear that, our, that the process of elimination points to that this is a reference to uh, sliver, the sighting of the first beam of light, so to speak, coming off of the moon, the sliver moon from the sun and all that stuff and, right. and uh, illuminating the, the beginning of a new month. And I think the, the last thing that I'd like to say for, for this um, is, you know, we, we have to be careful when we look at Israel and Judah and and I'm not advocating to um, succumb to man-made traditions and man-made laws. We know that a lot of things um, were added by them throughout history. We know that they adopted a lot of pagan practices in Babylon. We know that um, Christianity adopted a lot of pagan practices from Catholicism and, and Roman religion and all that. And, excuse me, Greek mythology. Man-made traditions we know are wrong for a lot of the times. They get people in trouble, but they're are some things that we can look to Judah for as an example, okay? Not everything, because we know that they, they added to Yah's word, which is strictly forbidden in Deuteronomy 4.2 and Deuteronomy 12.32, and Yeshua rebuked them for that. But it also says in, Je in Genesis 49.10 that the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. And so, and, and Yeshua also said to add to that is, is do as the, as the Pharisees who sit in the seat of Moses, when they sit in the seat of Moses, he says, do as they do, because they were reading from the Torah. They were teaching from the Torah yes. and that alone. He said, don't do as they do, but do as they say, because what they were doing was separate from what they were teaching from the Torah. Yeah. But when they were teaching from the Torah, when they would sit in the seat of Moses, and as Anthony gave multiple scriptures from the Torah that point to, I believe, without question, points to the sighting of Sliver Moon. 
but you you have to make the decision for yourself and that determination and like we said yeah well don't don't base your decision off of being and i'm i'm just gonna say this being being anti-semitic really because yeah, there are that's there are, dangerous there are a lot of people out there within the hebrew roots movement that are completely against judah and completely against the people in the land completely against israel and so anything that they do they they don't want anything to do with it oh they automatically assume if the jews are doing it this way oh then that's wrong they right. have they have to be doing it wrong and that is anti-semitic and that is wrong and it says right here in genesis 49 10 that the scepter shall not depart from judah nor a law given from between his feet until shiloh comes and so they have been entrusted the jewish people have been entrusted to Shamar to keep the Torah to guard the ways. I mean, it's not by coincidence that they were allowed to come back from the diaspora in 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 the the 1946. Right, they were allowed to return back to the land. They were allowed to have the right. Hebrew language recovered and restored. Something that's right. never happened all throughout history. Yet we have different groups of people saying because you know they. Their feelings towards the Jewish people. Oh well, you know what they're doing is wrong. It's all Babylonian. It's all evil. It's all wicked. And that mishpacha again, that is anti-Semitism, and that's not what we can base our decisions off of. Otherwise, we're going to be wrong. We're going to be judged and held accountable for that. Amen. And it's the same thing, mishpacha. You got to just have discernment, and wisdom, and and weed out what's correct and what isn't yes. by all, studying yes. the word. Rightly divide it. Exactly. Yes. There's Rightly. truth. You can. Re- yes. Thank you. Yes, rightly divide the words, just like in church. Not everything the pastor right. taught was wrong. You had to figure out what was bogus and what was correct. Same with Messianic congregations. I mean, so many of them adopted Judaism practices and stuff that they're mixing in the man-made traditions with the scriptural yes. uh, commandments. Yes. And you have to figure out which is correct Amen. and which isn't. Yes. And so, so it's the same with this, too. I mean, Judah is the reason why we still have the Torah, and that's biblical. Yeah. You know, and like he just quoted, I mean, Eliezer ben Yehuda in the 1800s, he's the one that brought, he brought back to life the Hebrew language. He created um, first, second, third, and fourth edition uh, Hebrew uh, dictionary books or whatever it was called um, throughout the early 1900s. And I mean, and that man went through the ringer to get this happening and but Yah blessed it and brought it around and then he brought Israel back around and he brought the land back around and I don't care what anybody says of how that came about it did not come by the Rothschilds and all that stuff I don't care if they had money involved in it whatever this was all by Yah's hand and by his will it would never have happened it doesn't matter who's got money it doesn't matter who wanted it to happen if it had not been Yah's will Israel would not have been reborn as a nation again and so it is yah's hand and yah used israel to bring torah back why because of the very reason why we are sitting here right now mishpaha and not still in the church mindset the 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 dispensationalism and everything yah bringing israel back into the land and the jews bringing torah back to the world is why we now exist in exactly. being torah keepers amen, brother. all by the hand of yah amen bro so don't don't be so afraid or hesitant or fearful to look to judah for certain things and and study why why do they do the way they do it you know i'm not saying they have it all figured out or they have everything right no they don't have everything right no one has everything right but there are things that we can look to um to them as an example um for historical records for historical references because they have always been yas people and they have been the ones that like we've been saying the past five minutes now they've been the ones to give they've been given charge over the Torah they've sure. been given charge over the commandments the Yah has allowed them to resurface these things in these last days and so please 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 do not listen to people who speak out against them openly who curse them who say you know because of, of them being the Jewish people that um, they're they're false or they're fake or anything that they teach is lies like please do not give an ear to to deceit like that because like Paul said, it's on us to rightly divide between the truth and, and deception. And we can't just assume anything and, and assume that people are, are wrong or evil because of what somebody else says. Amen. 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 All right, Ms. Baha. Well, as always, Shabbat Shalom. Y'all loves you or we love you. Yehovah loves you more. Amen.
נשבע שלום, משפחה. שלום, שלום.